and private farmers and ranchers all over Contra Costa County, all in the name of increasing conservation and protecting our shared natural resources. Tonight, we'll be highlighting some of that work we've got going all over the county here. We'll start with a brief video from our brand new Eco Steward Conservation Program, talking about the work they're doing in the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta. After that, we've got another brief video talking about our voluntary local program here and how we're partnering with ranchers to protect and improve conditions for endangered species here in our rangelands. Finally, we'll end with a series of interviews Derek Emmons collected from urban farms throughout Contra Costa County. Before we get started though, just a few quick points of order. We're gonna go through all the presentations and then answer any questions you guys have at the end. If you have any of them, please feel free to use the Q&A section down at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer them all. If you'd like to, we'd love to know who you are and what brought you here. Feel free to introduce yourself in the chat uh, and tell us maybe what your favorite fruit or vegetable is or maybe your favorite outdoor space here in Contra Costa County or wherever you're watching this from. And as you introduce yourself, we'll introduce ourselves. So like I said earlier, my name is Ben Weiss. I'm the Agriculture Conservation Manager here at Contra Costa RCD. I've been with the RCD now for just over four years and work mostly with farmers and ranchers to improve natural resource conditions on their farms and ranches. Uh, next, I'll ask Derek to introduce himself. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Derek Emmons and in October, I was hired as the Agriculture Conservation Coordinator at the CCRCD. Uh, my work involves providing technical assistance to farmers and ranchers uh, in applying for and engaging with opportunities in soil conservation and biodiversity stewardship. Thanks, Derek. Uh, next, I'll ask Evan to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Evan. I also started in October along with Derek, and I am one of the Eco Steward companies conservation technicians. Uh, this program was brand new when me and Dan started and we have been buying tools, got a truck and have built the program up at this point. We're going all around the county to implement restoration pro projects. And finally, I'll ask Dan to introduce themselves and if you want to introduce the video for us, Dan. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you, Ben. Um, so my name is Daniel Correa. I'm one of the, I'm one, I'm the other Eco Steward Conservation Technician along with Evan. Um, and our program focuses on restoration along the Delta and other areas around the Contra Costa, Contra Costa County. Um, so we are all over the place. Uh, we also do community work and we try to assist on any environmental projects that we can. Um, so um, moving on to the video we're gonna watch. Um, our video is called A Day in the Delta with the Eco Stewards. Uh, in this video, you will see a lot of the work that we do. And also you will be able to learn a lot about the invasive plants management practices and learn about the Delta because it's an important habitat that we need to protect and be able to uh, restore um, and make sure it stays safe for future generations. And with that, Eric, if you wanna start the video. Hi, my name is Evan Levy. And my name is Daniel Correa, and we're the Eco Seward Conservation Technicians at Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. We work to restore habitat for wildlife and improve ecosystem services for the people of Contra Costa County. A grant from the Department of Water Resources jump started this program to restore and maintain various DWR sites throughout the San Francisco Bay Delta. Our current project tasks include revegetation, invasive weed control, resource, mapping, and data collection. The eco stewards are also working on other community projects, including marking stormwater drains, installing a pollinator garden at the Richmond Greenway, an environmental education program, and planting trees. Much of our work occurs in the San Francisco Bay Delta. The Central Valley's two great rivers, the Sacramento and San Joaquin, meet in the Delta before flowing out into the Bay and Ocean. These rivers are essential to California's health. Delta water is the primary source of drinking water for 25 million Californians. The Delta also sustains important fisheries, millions of waterfowl, and thousands of farmers and ranchers producing billions of pounds of food. Even if you've never visited the Delta, your life as a Californian likely relies in some way on the health of this place. The eco stewards are working to improve the Delta's resiliency to threats like climate change, sea level rise, and habitat degradation. By planting native plants, maintaining existing native plant communities, and removing invasive plant species, the eco stewards are improving habitat conditions for wildlife in the Delta. 
So here we are at the uh, dunes at Dutch Slough, and this is a pretty rare and special ecosystem in Contra Costa County. The Antioch dunes used to stretch for about seven miles and they were hundreds of feet high. This is one of the restored sites uh, here in, in Dutch Slough, and we've got some pretty exciting dune plant species like the naked stem buckwheat and um, this dunes evening primrose and so as the eco stewards we've been coming out here to maintain this habitat and make sure that we um, clear up the space so that it's sandy rather than um, with like non-native grasses on top uh, this lets the bees and other insects burrow into the sand and also allow space for these uh, native dune-loving plants to colonize and take root. As you can see, um, over the last five years, the Department of Water Resources has done a great job at restoring this, this dune habitat, and we are here maintaining it at this point. Here we have the dunes evening primrose. This plant is important because its large flowers provide valuable nectar and pollen for hawk moths and other pollinators. Around it you can see a lot of invasive plant species. In order to increase the primrose's chances of surviving, one of the things we do around here is remove the invasive from around the plant. By removing these invasive plants by hand, we're reducing the competition for resources like nutrients, sunlight, and water. Techniques such as this have helped this plant and other important dune species thrive here at the Dutch Loo. On a landscape scale, the worst invasive plants can choke out entire ecosystems. In some places, a diverse mosaic of native plants and animals has been replaced by a monoculture of one invasive plant. Much of our time is spent maintaining just a handful of particularly aggressive non-native plants, such as Himalayan black blackberry, pompous grass, and poison hemlock. Let's tackle some blackberry! Himalayan blackberry is a non-native species of blackberry that can grow up to 40 feet tall it grows in moist soils, disturbed areas, pastures, rangelands, and roadsides. Large areas of blackberries are called brambles and can really take over forests and meadows. Animals eat the tasty berries and transport seeds all around California. The vast underground network of roots makes these plants incredibly difficult to eradicate. Himalayan blackberry can be managed by annually cutting the canes with hedge trimmers, loppers, and weed whackers and removing the dead blackberry to a dry area. Further treatment with herbicides is often necessary. Pampas grass is another aggressive non-native plant in the Delta. Horticulturists originally brought the grass into the U.S. from South America as an ornamental plant and it is sold at greenhouses and nurseries. Pampas grass can be identified by its tall, fountain-like shape, bluish, green, and V-shaped leaves. This invasive reproduces by dispersing millions of seeds into the wind. These seeds land in areas far away where the plant is able to rapidly make new colonies. Manual removal of mature pampas grass is next to impossible since it becomes such a large multi-stem plant. One method we use to get rid of pampas grass is to cut it back to the base and then use target herbicides to kill individual plants. Poison hemlock is a common invasive plant that belongs to the carrot family. It is found in pastures, riparian areas, and disturbed soils. Just like its name indicates, poison hemlock contains toxins that can harm or even kill livestock, wildlife, and humans if consumed. Some invasive plant communities can be managed by mechanical means, such as cutting and digging. However, there are times when invasive plants cover an area that is too big to be managed this way. In these situations, we often use herbicides. Herbicide application is a useful invasive plant management technique. It allows us to eliminate large areas of invasive plants in a short amount of time. By combining mechanical management techniques with smartly applied herbicides, we are able to drastically reduce the amount of chemicals needed to control these invasive plants. By replanting these areas with native plants after treatment, we're able to outcompete the non-native plant and establish productive ecosystems. Of course, routine maintenance is crucial to ensuring these newly established habitats stay healthy. These restored habitats clean our water, provide habitat for wildlife, and increase the recreational and aesthetic value of places in Contra Costa County. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining, joining us, us today, today and have, have a, a wonderful, wonderful Earth Week. week. All right, thank you, Dan and Evan, for that great video.
Uh, if you guys have any questions for them, feel free to put those again down in the Q&A section at the bottom of your window and we'll get to those at the end. Uh, next, we're gonna see a video that I helped put together with Eric uh, talking about our voluntary local program. It's a program that we designed with our partners down in Alameda County Resource Conservation District uh, to implement important rangeland projects uh, like livestock water systems and uh, pond restorations while also protecting uh, threatened and endangered species that use those resources. Um, I won't spoil too much, so I'll let Eric go ahead and hit play. Hello everyone, my name is Ben Weiss and I'm the Agriculture Conservation Manager here at Contra Costa Resource Conservation District and happy Earth Day. I'm here today to talk to you about our voluntary local program, a cooperative program between the Contra Costa RCD, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and voluntary ranchers here in Contra Costa County. We have over 169,000 acres of rangelands scattered over much of Contra Costa County. It's nearly five times the size of the city of Richmond. These rangelands support a number of wildlife and are actively grazed by cattle on both private and public lands. This grazing provides a number of environmental benefits, like reducing wildfire potential, preserving the mosaic of oak woodlands and grasslands, and keeps our rangelands healthy, drawing down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. These rangelands are also teeming with wildlife. You've probably seen and heard a number of hawks, eagles, sparrows, woodpeckers, coyotes, frogs, fish, bees, and more. Today, we're gonna to talk about two species in particular, the California tiger salamander and the California red-legged frog. These two species are what we call species of concern, meaning that they are both at risk of extinction unless we do something. These species are near extinction for a few reasons, but mostly because of the disappearance of their habitat, namely pools and ponds that the tiger salamander and red-legged frogs used to breed that were scattered across the Central Valley and Delta. Today, these salamanders and frogs use ponds throughout our rangelands as breeding grounds and habitat. These same ponds are also used by livestock for water. Over time, these ponds begin to naturally degrade and fill with sediment or face other structural issues. As this happens, the frogs and salamanders lose valuable habitat while the livestock lose access to reliable drinking water. Through the Voluntary Local Program, Contra Costa RCD, in partnership with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the ranchers themselves work together to fix these ponds and other habitats and rangelands for the benefit of both livestock and wildlife. By working cooperatively, and following a number of best management practices to protect frogs and salamanders, we're able to achieve a win-win scenario for everyone involved. Livestock and ranchers get an enhanced source of water, while frogs and salamanders get better and more plentiful habitats. Today, I wanted to show you one of these restorations that Contra Costa RCD helped facilitate a few years ago. These photos were taken by citizen scientist Mark Geary from up in the Morgan Territory. Mark has visited the pond every month since April 2013 and taken photos that show a pond slowly deteriorating. The spillway for this pond, where excess water was supposed to overflow to a creek, had eroded to the point that the pond was barely holding water. From some of these photos, you can see the pond with barely any water in it in the late summer. Ideally, these ponds go dry in late October slash early November, allowing for the livestock and wildlife to make the most use of it. By going dry, this prevents bullfrogs from moving into the pond, which are predators to the red-legged frog and the California tiger salamander. After some construction in October 2017 through the Voluntary Local Program, this pond's embankment was repaired and the spillway was rerouted, resulting in a higher volume of water within the pond itself and longer periods of water within the pond. In the following non-drought years, Water has been around the pond through early November before going dry and filling again in late December. Mark was lucky to take a video this past January of a California tiger salamander in the pond, taking a gulp before swimming back down to the base. These salamanders breed in the ponds from December through February before returning to nearby ground squirrel burrows where they live. Hopefully next spring, we see even more California tiger salamander in this pond and a few California red-legged frogs. I wanted to thank Mark Gary and Gary Nafis for letting us use their photos and videos. Both are active citizen scientists and provide crucial monitoring of these and other species. 
If you'd like to learn more, please check their website out at californiaherps.com and learn more about these and other snakes, lizards, turtles, frogs, and salamanders. Thanks for watching and learning about our efforts here in Contra Costa County to help threatened and endangered species recover in voluntary partnership with our ranching community. If you're interested in learning more about the program, please feel free to reach out and contact us. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again and happy Earth Day. I've seen those little salamanders. As Derek just messaged me, they're so cute. All right. And with that, I'll turn it over to Derek if you want to introduce your video. Sure. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, that was definitely the first time I have seen a salamander, tiger salamander. So I hope I see one in person one of these days. Um, so for the upcoming video segment, uh, Eric and I met a handful of urban and suburban farmers in Contra Costa uh, to learn more about their operations, uh, how they care for the earth, and their, hear more about their visions for the future. So I hope you enjoy the sample platter of Urban Ag. Go ahead and hit play, Eric. Greetings everyone, this is Derek Emmons with the Contra Costa Resource Conservation District. In honor of Earth Day, we're going to be taking a look at urban agriculture and interview numerous urban farmers and gardeners about the ways that they care for the land and their visions for the future. Let's take a look. Hey everyone, uh, we're here with Jasmine from Los Madanos uh, Community Health Care District. Uh, Jasmine, would you like to introduce a little bit more about yourself and the work that you do? Absolutely. Um, so hello everyone. Thank you so much for having me today, Derek. My name is Jasmine uh, and I am the Community Outreach Specialist for the Los Madanos Community Health Care District. And I'm also the lead organizer for the Ambrose Community Garden as well. Um, so we're here today talking about stable practices, right Derek? Yeah in honor of Earth Day. <laughs> um, so I guess to start, Jasmine, uh, you know, just looking at this community garden as well as Ambrose Community Garden, uh, you all are doing so many awesome practices, uh, both in regards to the soil, the diversity of the vegetation. Um, and I guess I was hoping to hear more about uh, what do, what, what do you and your volunteers do to help take care of the land? Yes, um, so I first want to start by saying that, um, you know, in this era of unhealth, that we believe that promoting sustainable practices is what's going to be best uh, to create a future for our earth. Um, so some of the sustainable practices that we practice here and also at the Ambrose Community Garden uh, are seed saving, practices. We also implement um, composting as well in which we take last year's crops out and we put them into a compost bin so that we can utilize that soil to continue to bring life back into the garden. Uh, another thing that we do to promote garden uh, sustainable practices as well is um, planting native flowers here so that we can attract native pollinators such as hummingbirds and bees and um, birds and all sorts of things like that. Um, so those are some of the sustainable practices that we implement at both sites. Hey, yeah, that's great. Yeah. That, <laughs> going back to the work that you're doing with youth, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you got started in this work. Absolutely. Um, so I can remember when I was a child going back to my first experience in the garden uh, where I was working with my mom um, in the garden and we planted things like corn and watermelon and zucchini and I remember harvesting the first watermelon that we ever grew and I was so impressed that little old us could grow our own food wow that was incredible to me so now that I'm an adult I can always remember that child that experience as a child and I wanted to give that to more children because that will stick with them forever. So I did pilot my first garden program at the Ambrose Community Garden. It was called Little Sprouts and we invited the Head Start kids to come out 
and exploring the garden. And not only were they gaining communication skills and social skills, but they were learning how to identify plants. When we first started that program, I asked the kids, where does a tomato come from? And they said, the store. And I said, okay, so we got a little bit of work to do. And through those couple months, the kids not only discovered that tomatoes taste good from their garden, but what a tomato looked like from the garden. And they learned how to identify that. From three to five years old, they were able to identify that. So I said, let's keep doing this work. And so now that I'm here at the Los Medanos Community Healthcare District, we do have a garden academy for the kids in which we have rolled out Zoom classes due to the pandemic. Um, ideally, we would love to have the children out here in the garden, exploring, digging, finding worms, tasting plants, seeing colors, and things like that. So those are the types of things that we do with the kids. So taking a look at this garden, as well as Embrace Community Garden that you manage, the amount of diversity of the crops and the, the work that you're doing with the soil is very impressive. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about how the way that you do agriculture cares for the land. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to first start out by saying that, you know, we do believe that sustainable practices are going to help us to create a better future. Um, so some of the ways that we implement that here at the Los Medanos Community Healthcare District Garden and at the Amherst Community Garden is by making sure that our um, plants are nice and native. We like to plant diverse crops um, that are going to promote the uh, coming of honeybees and native pollinators such as hummingbirds and butterflies and different things like that. We also do have a kids garden here where we talk to the kiddos all about where their actual source of food comes from. Um, and we also do composting here as well where we turn over the fall crops. And what we're doing right now actually is that we're turning over our fall crops um, and we're making it back into dirt so that we can plant our spring crops. So it honors the cycle of life completely. What is your vision for perhaps a best case scenario or sky is the limit dream for this community um, in finding some kind of balance or reciprocity between living and caring for the land? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think that ideally, you know, I know that not everybody has access to raised beds or a community garden, but I think that what the dream is that as a community, we can educate ourselves through food education, and then we can actually grow our own produce, just like we did, you know, in the past. We have become so far removed from the process that, you know, we all think that fruit is only available in the store but we can grow it ourselves. And I also always hear a lot of people say, I don't have a green thumb. I don't think that I could plant something. I encourage everyone to try. Um, so ideally in the future, I would love to see families out in their own spaces, whether that's on their balcony, growing potted plants, whether that's in their front yard or their backyard, whatever they have access to. Try to grow a little something because you'll be so surprised and pleased with what you can grow for your own family. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's a good thing. That's all you can do is try and you, you know, you're always going to be surprised and with what you can grow and it's organically sourced, it's locally grown, and those are the practices that I think would be wonderful for the community to start implementing now. We are in 2021 and we are seeing drastic signs of climate change. And I think that it would be most important for us to start implementing those practices now. Jasmine, thank you so much for this interview and taking the time to speak with us and showing us your work. It's, you know, it's, it's great work. Thank you so much, Derek, for having me. And, you know, I just want to continue to uh, educate and encourage the community that you have the power in your own hands to grow your own food. So thank you so much for having me today. the Healthy Hearts Institute in Pittsburgh, California. Uh, Ray, could you tell us a little bit about your operation and how long you've been here? So, um, 
I'm Ray Hartz. I'm the founder and executive director of Healthy Hearts Institute. Uh, we've been on this property for four years now. Um, it used to be a, a baseball field and a um, exercise track that was out here and kids used to run around out here. Um, and so I started Healthy Hearts uh, maybe about six years ago, um, but I've been on the property four years. And uh, our goal was really just to bring healthy organic produce to the community, uh, teach them about stress management through mindfulness and meditation. Uh, we do cooking and nutrition classes, um, and we also do an organic gardening and environmental sustainability class. Cool. So it sounds like the, the farm and uh, the farm is just one piece of a larger well-being program. Like I said, our goal is like, we know that nutrition is um, a big contrib contributor to our health, but we also know um, growing food has an impact on the environment as well, um, through carbon sequestration um, and, and, you know, uh, local food takes out emissions for food to travel. So we're thinking about like the total health of people, um, not just like food, but there's also like mental health there's fitness, there's uh, knowing how to cook and prepare healthy meals. So there's all these other um, components to being healthy um, and the environment is one of them. Self-care, community care, earth care, yeah? Yes, absolutely. Um, do you think you could tell us a little bit about, I guess in honor of Earth Day, uh, do you think you could expand a little bit about how the way that you farm uh, helps care for the land or care for Third. Yeah, so um, our goal is to be a no-till farm, um, and with a no-till farm, basically you're not tilling the, the farm, the, the ground, where uh, carbon would uh, go out into the air. Um, we want to keep as much carbon in the ground as we can um, that helps fight climate change. So that's one of the things that we're doing. Um, we're also composting out here and, and getting rid of uh, making more regenerative uh, uses of uh, our, our byproducts and getting into the farm again just like building the soil through organic matter um, and not polluting the air um, so everything we're doing is just like organically farming um, and no tilling just doing whatever we can to figure out how do we uh, tread lightly on the earth starting from what you're doing now and envisioning 20, 30 years in the future when you are an old man. Um, <laughs> what do you envision or what would be the best case scenario um, for this place and this community? For this community, uh, I think like having an abundance of food, um, the community members are out here uh, participating um, in, in the farming aspect of, of the operations. Participating in our classes, um, we have enough food that they're not going outside of this community for the food. And when I think about on a larger scale, like from citywide, like I see uh, this farm and, and models like it being able to supply food to the entire city, like um, where we're actually thinking about, you know, the caring for the the whole community of, of Pittsburgh. But, um, and thinking about our, our imp impact on the environment. Like, again, the emissions, local is super important. If we could do hyper-local, like, there's no reason why we can't grow enough food in this city uh, to, to support this uh, the city of Pittsburgh. And that's really what I'm thinking about. And then seeing like more trees, seeing people growing food in their own backyards, because all of that, even those small drops of, of carbon sequestration helps, right? So just getting everybody in the habit of, of thinking about the environment and climate change. Like, what can we do to um, combat it? And so everybody can play a role. Let me know what I can do to help. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. Well, um, th thanks, Ray, for taking the time for this interview. And uh, that's great. Thank you.
at Family Harvest in Pittsburgh, California uh, with Mary, Malik, Kim, and Chris. Uh, so, would you all like to tell us a little bit about your operation, a little bit of uh, what you've been up to here? Yeah, so um, we are a program of John Muir Land Trust. Um, and uh, I guess about a year ago, we actually um, started having apprentices. We um, employ and teach transition age foster youth how to grow their own food, um, give them community, give everyone a community, volunteers, people in the neighborhood, um, and job skills. And it's a year long program, so um, they stay here for a year. Um, and then there will be two people that will go on to a second year if they're really, really into it and want to continue going. Sounds like a cool program. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> we um, are also very big on regenerative agriculture, so we don't till. I've um, been trying to use a lot of permaculture practices and... Um, just trying different things. I've been farming organically for 10 years, but this is my first time farming with the thought of soil as a number one. More like a soil farmer rather than a plant farmer. Well, so that definitely brings us into our second question, uh, which is what type of agricultural practices do you do that cares for the earth? You mentioned a little bit of the permaculture and the soil care. But if y'all could expand a little bit upon that. Um, yeah. yeah, so, um, like, if you look over here, I'm trying to build compost that so that we're completely sustainable with compost and we're not getting compost from outside. But as for right now, um, we get compost from outside, and so we use um, compost and cover crop, and this, this time I cover cropped and I covered it with a tarp so it would kill it all. And then I'm just planting right into that without doing any tilling or anything like that. Um, we also have worms. So we'll be using worms to uh, help grow soil. Um, yeah. I'm trying different techniques that nobody else has tried like um, worm tractor. So I have like this little area where I have worms in it, and then um, I'm just kind of pushing the worms forward, feeding them from the front, um, and harvesting the uh, the castings from the back. And as they move forward, I'm hoping that they'll build all this soil as they're moving along. So we planted as just kind of a test run this year. We planted our first eight fruit trees, um, and that will be this whole back area. But right now we have cherries, figs, pluots, and an apple, and a lemon. Does someone else want to... Yeah. Hi, you guys. Malik, let's say 20 to 30 years from now, um, if sky was the limit, and uh, this farm, this community, things were looking great, what would be Well, we could just like work together as a group and like try to bond with each other and have fun, kind of. Well, I would like to see like all the plants grow and get bigger, really, and see where it goes from there. I'd love to see a whole food forest in Pittsburgh. So instead of just trees, they're fruit trees that are planted. And they're, instead of having just an open land, it's farmed. And that people have start doing their own farming in their, their backyard or on their, their deck. Um, and that the food that's in the schools is all coming locally from Pittsburgh. And um, the youth are learning how, the students will be learning how to cook the food, grow the food, and, um, and learn how to eat healthy. Team Family Harvest. Woo! <laughs> Come back and see our hedgerows that are going in this fall. I didn't know you guys planted this spring. Trees. That's cool. You guys planted trees. Yeah. Well, I'll, 
I'll be around, so y'all just call me whenever you need two hands. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We're here with Carolyn Finney uh, at the Coco San Sustainable Farm in Martinez, which is a project of the nonprofit Atlantis. Uh, Carolyn, what you're doing here uh, is vast. It's uh, full of life. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about your operation. Sure. So um, this farm started when we learned that the um, sanitary district whose property we're on was throwing away 50 to 200 million gallons of water a day that could be recycled and reused and that water is high in nitrogen phosphorus and potassium and micronutrients so it's fantastic for agriculture not necessarily very good for the bay although they discharge it at the bottom of the bay so the sunlight doesn't penetrate far enough to cause algae bloom but um, my feeling as uh, an environmentalist was as an activist was that we should turn the hose around and discharge that water on the land and feed some of the 20 at that time 22 percent of the people in the county which is um, maybe 350,000 um, were hungry of course now it's almost double and so this farm and this not this nonprofit have has four primary goals. The first is food equity, which is, is working to attack nutritional poverty. The second one is education, which has to do with public education, and I'll go into that more. The third one has to do with the environment, so these are four E's. And the last one, which we didn't start out with, but we added later, is economic development and job training. The sanitary district had about 150 acres of buffer land, so we asked for 15 acres, we negotiated and we eventually got 15 acres. And they were very interested in our educational and environmental goals because that's a big part of their mission. When we took it over, this land used to be underwater and um, the county quarry across the street and Central Sand had filled the bathtub, if you will, up with subsoil from the Highway 4 project. It was just minerals. It was functionally a desert. And this goes to the environmental goal. So our first goal was ecological restoration of the soil. And um, my co-founder is the genius. She's the head of horticulture at DVC, Bethlehem Black. And um, she, um, knowing that I knew nothing, told me to go out and get 15 big truck full, fulls of compost per acre. And I was like, where am I going to get that? and eco mulch covered the entire farm two feet deep in mulch which is carbon and then um, we got organic horse manure and covered the entire farm um, one foot deep in organic horse manure all this took about three years and um, um, so then um, that's basically compost lasagna you're putting down carbon, then you're putting down nitrogen, and then you need rain because you want it to um, disintegrate and you want the microbes to start breaking it down and turning it into soil. Well, of course, when we finished it, we had drought. And um, people were looking at us going, oh, you're going to set the place on fire. You're just piling poop out there. And um, we're like, no, it's not going to catch on fire. Well, the other side of the property caught on fire and the fire swept over to our fence line and turned and went the other way because our side of the property had a three foot blanket on it. And so even in August, uh, when uh, we dug down to put in the irrigation system, we immediately hit water. And so fire doesn't like water. So it, we actually were the opposite of causing fire. And so I actually hired an organic farmer from the high school to come out and help us harvest. And off that um, um, quarter of an acre, we donated 12,000 pounds of produce. That is like a massive number. And that was year one. That right? was year one. The next year we doubled it to half an acre. Again, we're just in an experiment. So we don't know if we double the production, are we gonna double the output? And we ran into all sorts of problems that cost us our winter crops on both ends. But 
we've donated 25,000 pounds of produce uh, from 16 rows from half an acre. So anyway, we had proof of concept. So we're hoping in the third year to produce uh, 100,000 pounds of produce and donate it. And um, so that's food equity that has to do with the environment. And then in terms of the soil, um, when we um, do things, although now that we have this greenhouse, everybody's fixated on these cute little seedlings, but our primary focus is underground um, because most agriculture destroys the microbes in the soil. Um, they, it destroys it by, um, um, the, the soil is a vast network, a vast world. Think of humans above the soil. What's below the soil is even more complex than our human society, right? It's the diversity of life, right? It's the it's diversity of life. And the, the people don't realize that uh, about 30% of, of, of global warming is caused by agriculture. And that's because they kill the life underground with agricultural, conventional agricultural practices, tilling, which breaks up the soil. So think of like if you took a giant tiller and you ran it over the cross, uh, across the top of Contra Costa County, what it would do to human activity. Well, a, a tiller destroys the uh, whole network under the soil, exposes the um, microbes to oxygen, which kills them. So one of the major goals of this farm is to um, protect the microbes so they can work with the plants, and it doesn't even matter if it's a weed, and sequester carbon in the soil. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of what one of my college professors used to say, which was always, feed the soil, not the plants. Right, feed the soil, that's right, exactly. And so I, just hearing about your operation already, I mean, that kind of already brings us to our Earth Day question, right? Yeah. Which is, um, you know, what kind of practices do you do that takes care of the land? And it sounds like between feeding the soil mm -hmm. and bringing life back to this right. hard pack mineral, um, you know, and using this reclaimed water, that's something that, you know, a lot of farms haven't really gotten to. And so I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about uh, what that looks like in this landscape and perhaps from there, what you envision towards the future. Um, to be a good steward of the soil, to the extent possible, you want to keep it covered with something. Um, just like you wouldn't just like take a baby and set it out in the sun, you know, naked. You don't want those microbes in the soil to be naked either. So you cover the soil with wood chips. Well, when we brought in, when EcoMulch brought in and donated that million dollars worth of wood chips, that was step number one. They covered the soil two feet deep and they continue to come back and add more. And um, so that was like a big blanket over the baby, the babies. Um, another thing is, and I mentioned this earlier, is you don't till or break up the, you do, you disturb it as little as possible. So the whole thing started with recycled water. And um, just to give you an idea how much um, fresh water there is on the planet, because this is really important. Um, everyone knows that two thirds of the planet is covered with salt water. And um, I mean, you ask a 10 year old and they're gonna know that. But if you ask them how much, if you were to take a globe and put the amount of recycled, uh, sorry, the amount of fresh water there is on the planet, uh, how big would it be? It'd be one drop on the whole globe, you know? And so we can't use our water just once. And that is the most important message um, and this farm is a demonstration that not only shouldn't we throw that fresh water away because it can be clean. They can, this water that we use is clean four times. It's so clean, it's cleaner than the water that comes out of your garden hose. So if you ever drank out of your garden hose when you were a kid, this water's cleaner than that. And um, they basically can separate the H2O from everything else. Now, fortunately for us, they do not take out 
the NPK and micronutrients. They do not take out the nutrients. We, so it's coming from the philosophy that we have to reuse every, all of our resources. All we need to do is take the purple pipes, and they're purple to notify you that they're recycled. And that's why the faucet over there and the little pipe sticking up is purple. And pipe the uh, water over into the central canal and pipe it down to the farmers. It's better for the farmers than potable water. It's neutral pH. It's high in nutrients. It's perfect. And so this farm, part of the value of this farm is to demonstrate, look, use this water, use this precious resource. Look at its fertility. Look what it does when you water things with recycled water. They grow like they're on steroids. They grow better um, because you're fertigating a little tiny bit every single day. So I'm gonna bring it to the final question then, which I think you've alluded to in regards to this notion of scaling up. Yeah. Um, 20 to 30 years from now, what is your hopeful vision for the future? 20, 30 years from now, how would you like to see um, you know, this, these type of practices or you know, some kind of right. harmonious relationship right. continue into the future? I would like to see every drop of water, fresh water that's cleaned by the sanitary districts to such a high level that really in an emergency you could drink it. Um, um, they say you can't drink it. And you shouldn't drink it, be, but you're not a plant, so you're not going to grow if you drink micronutrients. And so, um, certainly, um, I'd like to see them turn all that water around and put it on the land. None of it should be going into the ocean. None of it should be wasted. Um, preferably agriculture. Be um, you yeah. know, so, Carolyn, thank you so much for having me oh. out here to the Coco Sands. It's my Park. honor. Yeah, you, I think you've done a really wonderful job out here. And oh, I, thank and you. And I look forward to seeing uh, this project continue. And the Resource Conservation District, the Contra Costa Resource Conservation District, voted very early on to do anything they could to support us. And that really mattered because they saw our vision. And we were, you know, it was hard for people to see what we were trying to do. So you need true believers, I call them. You know, early on, the ones that say, yeah, you can do that and that is valuable and we're going to support you and put our, you know, name on your project. So, and so thank you to the, to the RCD. Yeah. I think that we're vaccinated. We can do this. We can do the fist pump. We can do the fist pump. <laughs> <laughs>
So we are a learning space and we are focused on regenerative uh, agricultural principles and because we have that flexibility of being a learning space, we get to practice and try on different approaches and learn from both our failures, our mistakes, and from our successes. And we do get to really uh, take the opportunity to utilize all the different inputs and wastes that we have here on the land. And for example, we build our own compost, we're building soil and saving financial resources as well as moving towards a closed loop system. So that is a really powerful direction that we are going towards. Cool. And when, and when you say closed loop system, as in the, the farm products, the organic matter that you're producing on site, the manure that's on site, you're recycling that back in, yeah? Yeah, so our students get to participate. They're mucking the stalls, they're building compost piles, they're sifting soils. We um, get to direct those that compost, that manure, um, to our orchards, to our food forest, and to our um, garden, and really focus on them doing, being involved in that process. I guess, could you both tell us a little bit more about what your long-term vision is for this place uh, 20 to 30 years from now, if we ever get a chance to retire? <laughs> um, what you would like, um, what you would like to see in regards to our relationship to the land and each other? Yeah. So in 30 years, we are retired. <laughs> We're relaxing. Um, but we have inspired and educated and equipped our uh, current youth in 30 years with the tools, the inspiration, the resources to take the reins and advocate for environmental justice, for holistic land management, and hopefully uh, here they're getting to see um, our steps towards that, uh, towards that holistic land management and that regenerative um, agriculture and we have goats we have sheep we have horses and we have the 22 acres that we get to practice um, integrating um, all of those elements together and we hope in 30 years that uh, our community that we are serving through education um, that they're able to use our site as a demonstration site and adopt those those tools, those visions. And we hope to have really healthy soil. So rather than just looking at what we've created and programs and production, it's more about like, what is our land look like in 30 years? And is it still healthy? Is that soil nice with that beautiful compost smell? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think thus far, y'all are already making a beautiful and fully functional demonstration site. Thank you both so much for having me out here at Sienna Ranch. Um, and before we close out, I was wondering if you had any questions for me. Yeah, I think um, we're really excited about where the future can go and what we can do with this land. And we know that we can't do it alone um, and that we all have to work together and collaborate and um, learn from each other. And so I'm curious, how does the CCRCD help organizations like us? How do we work together? What does that partnership look like? Ooh, there's many pathways <laughs> forward on that one. Um, so part of what we do is help support urban farmers, rural farmers, community groups with uh, funding programs and grants such as the NRCS EQIP program. There's the uh, CDFA Healthy Soils Program that goes to fund planting things like hedgerows, cover, implementing cover crops, mulching. Um, you know, and in addition to these government funding pathways, there's numerous nonprofit networks that we are also uh, affiliated with, and local community groups like our watershed councils and Friends of 
watershed groups. And so, you know, moving forward, you know, just maintaining those open, open doors. And as we hear of opportunities, trainings, uh, you know, we'll stay connected. And uh, if you, likewise, if you guys need support or have any ideas, you know, let us know. All right. Thank you, Thank Dave. You. <laughs> Julie, Emily, Thank you so much for having me here at Sienna Ranch uh, and for sharing a bit about your operation, your vision, and just all the great work that you're doing. Um, I think coming out of this, I'm feeling much more uh, uh, optimistic about the future and uh, really look forward to working with you in the future as well. Thank, Thank you, Jared. You, Jared. <laughs> Thank you, RCD. Yeah. <laughs> Well, now that you've gotten a taste of a handful of urban ag operations, I hope you're inspired to start your own backyard garden or to get involved with existing operations. I want to give a shout out to Urban Tilth and Planting Justice, both of which are doing outstanding work in food justice and community empowerment. If you would like to stay involved and uh, keep in touch, uh, please email me at the contact below and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks everyone for the great videos. I hope they were informative. Uh, we'll now turn it over to the audience. If you guys have questions for us, feel free to uh, drop them down in the Q&A section of your window at the bottom of your screen, or go ahead and put them in chat. Um, we've got people monitoring that for us. Um, we'll give you a few minutes if you do have questions, but I wanted to ask Derek first, what was the name of that goat? That baby goat did not have a name. Did not have a name. If I were to name it, uh, I would have named, named him... Uh, uh, chuckles. Chuckles, yeah, because he was definitely making some sound by the end of it. <laughs> All right, and then Evan and Dan, if you had to pick a favorite site to work at, what's your favorite site right now? I mean, I think the sand dunes that we highlighted in our video uh, are probably my favorite site right now. The the evening primrose. Um, the big white flower is, you know, danger, flower. right? Yeah, um, it is a listed plant, and it is, you know, just going bonkers, like hundreds and hundreds of flowers out there. Mm -hmm. It's also nice because, uh, as you could see, Dan pulling out those the poison hemlock, like the roots just come all the way out with the sand and the loose soil. It's like really satisfying. It just makes it nice and easy. Mm, yeah, so it makes it makes the job very satisfying. How about you, Dan? Um, I mean, I got to agree with ben. Um, Dutch Lou is a pretty nice area. Uh, and the type of work that's happening there is also pretty important. Um, so I think uh, for now, I mean, we all, we're always getting new projects every month. Uh, but for now, I think Dutch Lou is going to be the winner for that. Cool. I think Heidi has a question for us. Yeah, I just yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I helped in some of that plan to get Dutch Lou, not a lot of it, but some of it. And it is, it looks beautiful. You guys are doing a great job. Um, it's the first time I've seen it. So uh, it warmed my heart. Thank you guys for taking such good care of it. Yeah, I mean, R River Partners has been doing most of the, most of the work out there over the last, you know, five years or whatever it's been, but me and Dan try our, try our best to make our impact. We're starting small from the sand dunes moving along. Yeah, all thank Dutch you. Loop. Yeah. We'll fix it all here in what, a year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looks great. All right, I don't see too many questions. So I'll go ahead and just start wrapping things up and say, if you guys have any uh, further questions, um, I think all of these videos will be available on our YouTube channel and we'll probably post them to Facebook here at some point or another. Um, and I think all of our contact information is in those. We can also drop those in the chat. If Heidi, if you wanna do that really quick for us. Just put all our emails in there. Uh, feel free to email us with more questions. We're, we're happy to answer them. Um, thanks everyone for coming. I hope you guys learned a 
something new and had a good time learning about all the fun work that we've got going on here in Contra Costa County. Uh, be sure to tune in tomorrow at one o'clock, I believe, Heidi. She can back me up in a second. Uh, Chris Lim, yep, our executive director, and Heidi at one o'clock tomorrow uh, will be taking us all over Rodeo as we do a socially distanced community cleanup. Um, I may jump in. I think we're going to have some other staff members jump in on that. But by and large, we're going to be interviewing uh, volunteers as they're picking up trash all over the community of Rodeo. Um, we hope you can join us. And yeah. So thanks again for coming, everybody, and happy Earth Week. Have a good night.